The Irony of Kingship in Edward II. F. P. Wilson, in his book Marlowe and the Early Shakespeare, published in 1953, had stated while discussing Christopher Marlowe's Edward II that among all of his plays, this play was a full study of kingship, and here Marlowe shows awareness of the irony of kingship. This lecture will look at this contentious issue of kingship in this play and analyze the implications of the phrase irony of kingship by looking at the identity and character of King Edward II, both as political ruler and man as described by Marlowe, his contentious friendship with Gaveston, the related questions of the natural and the unnatural in this play, and the question of the divine right to rule. Before we begin to discuss the irony of kingship, let us first discuss the important dimensions of kingship both historically and in the play. Christopher Wesman shows how the idea of the king's two bodies as Ernst Cantorowicz delineates it, was first legally postulated in the 1560s by Edmund Plowden, who said, The king has in him two bodies, viz. a body natural and a body politic. His body natural, if it be considered in itself, is a body mortal, subject to all infirmities that come by nature or accident. But his body politic is a body that cannot be seen or handled, consisting of policy and government and constituted for the direction of the people and the management of the public weal. And this body is utterly void of infancy and old age and the other natural defects and imbecilities which the body natural is subject to. Gregory Bredbeck calls this king's two bodies, a hybridization of medieval and renaissance thought, an Elizabethan inheritance that is most central to the understanding of the representation of Edward II. It is of great irony that being a king that entails great power and responsibility, Edward II does not respect the difference between the two bodies natural and politic, and repeatedly gives them away, his own physical privacy and the kingdom's wealth and power, to his favorite, Gaveston, who is a parasitic self-server at his best, although he does have some affection for the monarch. The play begins with Edward's invitation to Gaveston to share the kingdom with thy dearest friend, which both opposes and destabilizes accepted social and political arrangements. Soon he is bestowing political positions on him for the sake of friendship. I here create thee, Lord High Chamberlain, Chief Secretary to the State and me, Earl of Cornwall, King and Lord of Man. I'll give thee more, for but to honour thee is Edward pleased with kingly regiment. Fearest thou thy person? Thou shalt have a guard. Wantest thou gold? Go to my treasury. Wouldst thou be loved and feared? Receive my seal. Save or condemn, and in our name command, whatso thy mind, effects, or fancy, likes. The friendship of Edward II for Gaveston also merits close study from the point of view of ancient theories of friendship, if not from the standpoint of queer, queer theory, as the word homosexual that was coined in the late 19th century would be an anachronistic term to describe the relationship of Edward II and Gaveston, however suggestive sexual overtones it may be laced with. L. J. Mills, while reflecting on the friendship of Edward II and Gaveston, analyzes that Edward follows several of the classical and conventional views about friendship, 
Elginals summarizes that 1. The terms of endearment used between Edward and Gaveston are characteristic of friendship stories. 2. The sharing of goods and honors is a part of the tradition and goes back to the philosophical discussions of friendship. 3. The substitution theme briefly represented in the play is common in the friendship tradition and finally Edward's neglect of the queen in his devotion to Gaveston is illuminated by the conventional exaltation of friendship over love. This naturally leads Mills to the question as to why does Edward II in his yearning for intimate friendship and charming companionship not only forfeit his crown but also lose his life. According to L.J. Mills, Edward II does not follow the classical ethics of friendship in his choice of friends. He does not test the people he considers to be friends and nor does he try and distinguish between a real friend and a flatterer. He is unable to differentiate between worthy and unworthy companions. Trusts Gaveston, a self-confessed flatterer, naively and absolutely, and hotly defends him against all open and barbed attacks of the bar barons to the point of starting a civil war. If the first defect is his inability to choose his friends carefully, the second and more significant difficulty, which is very obvious and very pertinent to the discussion here, is that Edward II is a king. Aristotle, in his Nicomachean Ethics, Book 8, had insisted that equality of nature and circumstances was of paramount importance for a real friendship to be founded. The friendship of superiors and inferiors, or a king and a subject, is of a different tenor than that between equals, a fact that Edward II disregards completely. As king, Edward's first duty is to the state and not to succumb to personal preferences. This implies that he has to be the body politic. As we have seen above, over and above the body natural and should devote his time and efforts to his regal duties and responsibilities. It is a fundamental irony that King Edward II, from the point of recalling Gaveston from exile to England, never once inhabits the role of a king and wrongs his kingdom with neglecting its interests, angers the barons and merely uses his kingship to no better end than to shower wealth and honours on his favourites. Edward's rule, aided and abetted, first by Gaveston and then by the other flatterers, Spencer and Baldock, becomes gross misrule. He exposes himself as a king who is entirely unfit to rule his kingdom. He prioritizes the relationship with Gaveston above all kingly concerns and is reluctant to follow the advice of the barons at every step. He says, Will you not grant me this? Aside, in spite of them, I'll have my will. In Act 1, Scene 1, line 76 to 77. Ironically, he is not ignorant of the privileges that royal status confers on him and that it has the potential to structure a certain kind of identity. It is just that he refuses to live up to his political role and fulfill the duties and responsibilities it entails. His awareness of his royal status makes him utter blustering orders and threats such as the following. Well, Mortimer, I'll make thee rue these words. Beseems it thee to contradict thy king? Frownest thou thereat, aspiring Lancaster? The sword shall plain the furrows of thy brows and hew these knees that now are grown so stiff. I will have Gaveston and you shall know what danger it is to stand against your king. 
These and many other similar instances of his attempts at dominance fail, rendering the words of the head of the state hollow and further nullifying his political role, as his orders and vociferous threats are never taken seriously, nor obeyed by the barons. Moreover, his one attempt at kingly courage on a battlefield in Act 4, Scene 5, is frustrated by advice from his flatterers to flee. Where he fails to live up to the role of his body politic and establish a respectful persona of the head of the state, it is again ironical that at a personal level, he is a man of certain virtues, chief among them being his genuine loyalty to those whom he has chosen to be friends. Una Ellis Firma correctly opines, Edward has the power of inspiring undying affection in the men within the circle of his intimacy. Gaveston, Spencer and Baldock all begin their relations with Edward with a touch of policy and all end by standing by him to their deaths. Had Edward II not had the identity of a king but only been any other man, then there would not be such controversy about his behavior. One may note that the question of the identity of the Edward as king of the realm is inextricably bound up with the twin concepts of the natural and unnatural and Edward's deportment unfortunately illustrates the latter. The 16th century read the word natural as a reference to heredity. Behaving according to nature meant following the example of one's parent. So it is extremely unnatural of Edward II to disregard the legacy and disobey the orders of his greatly successful late father, King Edward I. His unnatural behavior is displayed not only in his disobedience to his father's wishes by having Gaveston recalled from exile after his father's death and his own accession to the throne, but also includes his neglect of his peers, conferring privileges on his lower class friends, bestowing English titles to the foreigner Gaveston, failing to look after his people in spite of the fact that the royal relationship was seen as comparable with that of a father to a child, gross neglect of and cruelty towards his wife Queen Isabella, rash governance unlike Edward I, and finally privileging his relationship with Gaveston above everything else in the world of the play, even above the protection of his land and its people. Kent, Edward II's brother, is appalled by the latter's invariable disregard of duty coupled with class transgression and remarks. Unnatural king to slaughter noblemen and cherish flatterers? Act 4, Scene 1, lines 8 to 9. On this point, Jill Barker notes, It is within a structure supported by nature that feudal duty has its place. This is why the lords can feel that they no longer owe Edward the duty of allegiance, once they see him as unnaturally neglecting them. Their behavior is also unnatural in that sense of being outside the family-like relationship between noble and king. It is the king's nature that is responsible for determining the politics of the nation and here incenses his peers and pushes them towards rebellion and civil war. What is also supremely ironical is that for a play which obsesses with kingship and right ruling and whose conflict and tragedy emanates from the king's failure to rule well, the play puts forth no definitive stance on the question of the divine right of kings to rule. The Encyclopedia Britannica defines this concept of divine right of kings as a political doctrine in defense of monarchical absolutism, which asserted that kings derived their authority from God and could not therefore be held accountable for their actions by any earthly authority 
such as a parliament. Originating in Europe, the divine right theory can be traced to the medieval conception of God's award of temporal power to the political ruler, paralleling the award of spiritual power to the church. By the 16th and 17th centuries, however, the new national monarchs were asserting their authority in matters of both church and state. King James I of England was the foremost exponent of the divine right of kings. The play never dwells on this concept and never stresses on the unwritten loyalty of the king's followers, which would sanction an absolutist monarchy and bring into question the issue of deposition of the ruler. This concept of divine right to rule is also never mentioned in Act 5, Scene 1 or the abdication scene where Edward II is forced to relinquish his crown under threat. Here too his identity is of a father who wants to protect the rights of his minor son Prince Edward holds sway above his identity of a king and persuades him to acquiesce to the wishes of his conquerors. What can be greater irony than King Edward II's realizing the importance of kingship at the time when he has to abdicate the crown? This scene is poignant and in Edward's eloquence we see Marlowe at his poetic best. This scene makes us pity him and his situation and makes his fall tragic. There is a combination of helplessness, pathos and anger in his words as he realizes his abject position. But when I call to mind I am a king, methinks I should revenge me of the wrongs that Mortimer and Isabel have done. But what are kings when regiment is gone, but perfect shadows in a sunshine day? My nobles rule, I bear the name of king. I wear the crown, but am controlled by them, by Mortimer and my unconstant queen, who spots my nuptial bed with infamy, whilst I am lodged within this cave of care, where sorrow at my elbow still attends, to company my heart with sad lament that bleeds within me for this strange exchange. But tell me, must I now resign my crown to make usurping Mortimer a king? Yet again, it is deeply saddening and profoundly ironical that even the momentous occasion of abdication of his crown does not ensure any self-introspection and taking stock of errors on Edward II's part and so he says, Ah, Lester, weigh how hardly I can brook to lose my crown and kingdom without cause. And later, petulantly asks, Yet, how have I transgressed unless it be with too much clemency? This shows that he does not realize completely the extent of his wrong governance and failure of his rule and is not conscious of the necessity of the separation of the political and the personal or the public and the private. His all-consuming passion for Gaveston and the other favourites motivates him at every stage, however detriment detrimental it may be for him and the nation. The Wheel of Fortune comes full circle when Edward II, who had goaded Gaveston in Act 1, Scene 1 to torment the Bishop of Coventry, by throwing him in the gutter and thus christen him anew, is himself tortured by his gaolers on Mortimer's orders and made to stand in a cesspool and even shaved in sewerage water in Act 5, Scene 3. Even then, his loyalty to his favourites is not shaken. However much he may be ruined, both personally and politically, for them. He says, Immortal powers that knows the painful cares that waits upon my poor distressed soul. O oh, level all your looks upon these daring men that wrongs their liege and sovereign, England's king. O oh, Gaveston, it is for thee that I am wronged. For me, both thou and both the Spencers died. And for your sakes, a thousand wrongs I'll take. The Spencers' ghosts Wherever they remain, wish well to mine. Then tush, for them I'll die. 
If Edward's dispassion towards kingship and failure to be a good king leads to his tragic downfall, it is Mortimer's desire for kingship, coupled with his ambition, arrogance and Machiavellian scheming, that ironically brings about his imprisonment and death in the hands of King Edward III. In the final irony of kingship in the play, it is left to the minor King Edward III to display greater sagacity and acumen than all his elders, be it his parents or Mortimer, as he recognizes what they could not, that the passions need to be accommodated to the that the passions must be accommodated that the passions must be accommodated to the moral and legal structures of civil society and that public virtues too must be somewhat tempered by the private as thomas cartley notes a king who can both think and feel but subdue his feelings to the lordship of his reason as opposed to his will edward the 3rd may well supply the missing link both to right rule and the humoral idea in this play. In Act 5, Scene 1, Edward II, while raving at the loss of his crown, had said, Commend me to my son and bid him rule better than I. Whether or not this message of an unsuccessful king was carried to his son, Edward III shows a decided promise, unlike his father, of being an able king. So in this lecture, we have seen that the fact, the irony of kingship in this play lies in King Edward II's devaluing kingship. As he himself says, I bear the name of king only. He is only a king in name. He, he always at every step is privileging the personal over the political. So he is doing what is unnatural and he is disregarding the prestige associated with kingship till the point he is forced to abdicate. But even then, his recognition of the importance of kingship is very fleeting and he never once introspects as to where his errors lie. And it is finally ironical that a little child, King Edward III, shows more intelligence, both in terms of political intelligence as well as emotional intelligence in handling the crisis and conflicts towards the end, meeting out justice towards the wrongdoers and revenging upon his father's death and being an able ruler unlike his father.